scared me. Um, I'm Ruth, I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm going to be uh, leading us to the next 30 minutes or so um, as we celebrate the Christmas story. Uh, we're coming to the end of a series um, on experiencing God through Scripture. Uh, if you've been able to join us for the other weeks, or um, if you've listened online uh, to the Advent devotions, you'll know that we've been looking at different practices, different methods of reading scripture that help us to um, experience God and hear from God through these ancient texts. Uh, so, you know, um, the first week of Advent, we looked at using our imaginations. We were very engaged and involved, a so-called Ignatian method. Um, and then we looked at studying the text in a historical context. Um, and then last week we took a contemplative approach to reading scripture uh, with that fancy uh, Latin title, Lectio Divina. Um, and this week we are looking at engaging um, scripture as worship. And we're going to talk a little bit more uh, in a few moments about what do we mean by worship. Um, but I'm going to preface all this by saying that this is going to be a bit of an interactive uh, service. Um, I know that's not everyone's cup of tea, but I'm going to ask you to please uh, engage in this. Worship is not a passive thing. It's not something you sit and listen to or watch other people doing. Uh, worship is something that you do, something that we um, do with our whole selves. Um, so I hope that you're going to be uh, willing to participate um, throughout the service. As Matthew mentioned, this is also the fourth week of Advent. Um, it's the week when we traditionally uh, focus on joy. And um, so this morning, uh, we're going to uh, look at engaging scripture through worship by focusing on Mary's incredibly joyful song, uh, commonly referred to as the Magnificat. Uh, Magnificat is just the first word of the song in Latin, Magnificat meaning magnify. So her song in some translations starts, my soul magnifies, so it's Magnificat. So we're going to read that story, and Rebecca's going to come and read that to us. Just to give some context, uh, Mary has just learned from the angel Gabriel that the Holy Spirit's going to come upon her, and uh, she will give birth to Jesus, the Son of God. Um, Gabriel's also told her by way of confirmation that her elderly relative, um, who would be past such things, is actually miraculously pregnant also. And so this is where we start the story. Luke 1, 39 to 56. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. So when Mary uh, found out that she, a, a young teenager, um, an unmarried virgin, was to bear the Son of God, um, she trekked about 70 miles, we think, to see Elizabeth. No doubt she was full of anxiety, doubt, confusion. I'm sure there were lots and lots of questions running through her head. But when she meets Elizabeth and sees that she's pregnant, and uh, when Elizabeth honors Mary and calls her blessed among women, the mother of my Lord, Mary breaks forth into this beautiful, uh, joyful song. Um, this song draws from a number of Jewish scriptures, particularly the song of Hannah, 
And we've looked at this in, in past messages. We're not going to study that today because we're not doing study, we're doing worship. Um, but you can read that um, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2. Hannah was a, a hero of the, of the Jewish faith and, and um, this song of Mary's draws heavily from that song. Also draws from a number of the different psalms. And the Magnificat, Mary's song of praise, as recorded by Luke, is therefore deeply rooted in Israel's um, sense of identity and history um, and religious identity. It echoes the longing of the Jewish people down through the centuries. Artists have imagined Mary composing a song like this. I don't think this is very historically accurate, I'm, I'm guessing. Uh, for one thing, we think that Mary was probably a lot, lot younger. She was probably only 13 or 14 years old, a very young girl. Um, much poorer, obviously. Um, I would think much more agitated, right? Uh, she's not some serene lady of means who's sitting there calmly composing. Uh, she was a pregnant teenage girl who lived in a culture where uh, fornication and adultery uh, resulted in stoning. So she was fearing public humiliation and rejection at best, and possibly even violence and even death. So this is a defiant song, I think. This is perhaps sung with clenched fists, maybe through tears. And yet, nevertheless, it is a song of worship and of joy. Um, here, we see that for Mary, worship is a reorientation towards God. It's breaking away from the anxiety, the doubt, the confusion, to focus on God and who God is. I don't think this is escapism. I'm sure that Mary was very, very aware of the seriousness of her situation and the potential danger and the, the uncertainty of her situation. And yet she was also very aware of God, aware of God's faithfulness demonstrated down through the ages and aware of God's character as someone that Mary could depend upon, someone that she could, she could trust in, she could hope in. And the result of this worship, this recentering on God, even in the midst of fear and confusion, was joy. Joy over what God had done for Mary in choosing her. Joy over what God had done in the past, uh, showing mercy to one generation after another. Joy over what God was going to do and was in the process of doing, bringing about justice, overthrowing oppression, fulfilling all those hopes and dreams of the Jewish people and of all who are poor and are marginalized. N.T. Wright wrote of this song, I think we have it on the slide. It is the gospel before the gospel, a fierce, bright shout of triumph, 30 weeks before Bethlehem, 30 years before Calvary and Easter. It goes with a swing and a clap and a stamp. It's all about God and it's all about revolution. And it's all because of Jesus. Jesus who's only just been conceived, not yet born, but who has made Elizabeth's baby leap in her womb and has made Mary giddy with excitement and hope and triumph. We're going to listen to Mary's song again, this time sung, and I want us to try and listen to the joy in this, in this version of the song. Um, and it's illustrated with paintings of the Magnificat done by artists from all around the world, so lots of different uh, perspectives on the Magnificat. So let's join with Mary in her joy as we listen.
few minutes now um, to reflect personally on the Magnificat. Um, when you came in, you should have got one of these. Um, if you didn't, there are copies on the two side tables. Um, and we're all going to take one of these, and um, we think in different ways. We, we have different ways of responding. Uh, so there are two different options here, and you're welcome to do both, obviously. Um, on one side, uh, there is a, a coloring page. Uh, it's the words of the Magnificat are written out. Um, and there are pencil crayons at the two tables. And uh, you can think of, of what emotions are expressed um, in this song and, and what colors you associate with these emotions um, and, and what resonates with you. What would you want to echo back to God through your own song of praise? Um, so you can color that in in the colors that, that kind of speak to you. For those of us who are more word-minded, more word-oriented, on the other side of the paper are some prompts um, to help you to compose your own Magnificat. Um, again, there are pencils and pens on the tables. Um, so please feel free to go to the tables, take some of those, um, come back to your seats. And we're going to spend about uh, five to ten minutes um, just really focusing on making this our own, making our own song of praise 
um, to God. And we're going to try and keep a, a worshipful atmosphere so it's not time to go and get more coffee and chat. And, you know, we, we really want to make this a worshipful experience. And we're going to listen to another version of the Magnificat that we'll play um, while we take this time. So please uh, go to the tables and, and get whatever materials you need and, uh, and we'll come back in a few minutes.
we're now going to have an opportunity to sing together that uh, we're going to the words will be up on the screen and we're going to teach you the melody to um, sing the first couple lines of the Magnificat. It's a, we have a, an English translation of this. It's a, an English language version. So we're going to sing through a couple times um, just to get the melody down so that everybody can be familiar with it. And then we're going to sing it in the form of a round where this side is going to sing with Rebecca and this side is going to follow me. So it's a simple melody. Sing out my soul, sing out my soul, sing out and glorify the Lord who sets us free. Sing out my soul, sing out my soul, sing out and glorify the Lord God. Sing out my soul, sing out my soul, sing out and glorify the Lord who sets us free. Sing out my soul, sing out my soul, sing out and glorify the Lord God. Everybody got it? You want to do it again? We'll do it again one time. Sing out my soul, sing out my soul, sing out and glorify the Lord who sets us free. Sing out my soul, sing out my soul, sing out and glorify the Lord God. Okay, now this side, follow me, Team Brian, and that's Team Rebecca over there. So, we'll start again. You guys follow me. Sing out my soul, sing out my soul, sing out and glorify the Lord who sets us free. Sing out my soul, sing out my soul, Sing out and glorify the Lord who sets us free. Sing out my soul, sing out my soul. Sing out and glorify the Lord who sets us free. Sing out my soul, sing out my soul. Sing out and glorify the Lord who sets us free. Sing out my soul, sing out my soul. Sing out and glorify the Lord who sets us free. Sing out my soul, sing out my soul. Sing out and glorify the Lord who sets us free. Sing out my soul, sing out my soul. Sing out and glorify the Lord God. Thank you. So the Magnificat is a song of worship, it's a song of joy, but it's not only a song of joy. Worship can also sometimes uh, be dangerous. Uh, reorienting ourselves to God can be challenging. It can, um, it can provoke us to, to realize that we need to change or to demand change. Um, after all, Mary's song uh, is, as N.T. Wright put it, revolutionary. It talks of God showing favor on those who are marginalized and exploited, of thwarting the plans of the arrogant, of, of rulers being brought down from their thrones and of the lowly being lifted up, of the rich being sent away empty while uh, the hungry are filled with good things. 
We don't know um, exactly where Elizabeth lived, uh, but there's a very good chance that from her house, Mary could have seen Herod the Great's recently completed uh, palatial uh, complex. It was a, a very majestic uh, building. It was known as Herodium. And at the time, it was the largest such complex in the Roman world. Um, certainly, it would have been impossible to miss it from Bethlehem. Herodium sits on top of an artificially constructed uh, mountain, uh, 2,500 feet high at the edge of the desert. I think we have a picture of the ruins as they still stand. Uh, this is taken from just outside of Bethlehem. And before uh, the Romans came and besieged it in AD 71 and destroyed it, uh, there were four massive stone towers uh, at each of the corners measuring 18 meters in diameter. We don't know how tall they were, um, but certainly this was a huge structure. And it's interesting to think of Mary looking out at this very ostentatious uh, display of, of power and of wealth and singing, God has brought down rulers from their thrones and has lifted up the humble. Mary singing the Magnificat is not always pictured like this, the serene lady. Uh, sometimes it's portrayed more like this, cast down the mighty. Um, the Magnificat has been recognized as a song of revolution, of turning the tables for a very long time, actually. Um, it's been hated and feared by oppressive regimes. Um, during the British rule of India, for example, the Magnificat was prohibited from being sung in church. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German pastor who, and a theologian who was um, executed by the Nazis, um, he called the Magnificat the most passionate, the wildest, one might even say the most revolutionary hymn ever sung. He writes that it has none of the sweet, sugary, or childish tones that we find so often in our Christmas hymns, but it is a hard, strong, uncompromising song of bringing down rulers from their thrones and humbling the lords of this world, of God's power and the powerlessness of man. Another martyr, Oscar Romero in uh, El Salvador, likened Mary and the poor that are mentioned in the Magnificat uh, to the coffee workers who were denied their wages and the union workers who were abducted and tortured. In Argentina in the 1970s, in Guatemala in the 1980s, and in the Philippines in the 1990s, the government has banned as subversive either reciting or displaying the Magnificat, Mary's song, in public. Many of us, I think, have heard the Magnificat and read it so many times during Advent over so many years. I think we miss the fact that it is revolutionary, that it does call for change. Uh, we're going to watch um, a, a short video, another reading, um, that maybe will help to bring out a little bit of that call for justice, even in our own time. So let's watch that. <laughs> the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For God has looked with favor on the lowliness of God's servants. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is God's name. God's mercy is for those who fear God from generation to generation. God has shown strength with God's arms and scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. God has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. God has helped God's servant Israel in remembrance of God's mercy. According to the promise God made to our ancestors, to Abraham and Sarah and all God's descendants forever. Amen. So 
worship doesn't just shift our focus to God, it reorients our priorities. It challenges our values. It forces us to ask, who and what are we aligned to? To the proud, to the rulers, to the oppressors, or to the lowly, the humble, the poor? God called a poor, insignificant girl to partner in God's great work of redemption. And Mary's response was to proclaim a reordering of society. Just as Jesus was later to proclaim, quoting from the prophet Isaiah with these words, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The spirit of the Lord brings a message of great reversal, where the first will be last and the last will be first. Where is the poor, the meek, the persecuted who are blessed? If the spirit of the Lord is in us, what do we proclaim? How are our values aligned? As one poet put it, let's holler and act as if we too have God in our bellies. We're going to take a moment now to reflect on the great reversals that we long to see in our world and in our society and even in our own lives. And we're going to ask God to bring freedom to the captives at every level, spiritual, emotional, physical, um, social, and in terms of justice. We're going to ask God um, to bring justice for the oppressed. And we're going to take a moment of silence and contemplate on that. And then I'm going to uh, light the Advent candles and we'll say a responsive prayer. So um, let's just take a moment to think about that. We're going to light the candles, a candle of hope in the God who brings justice and freedom. A candle of peace through God, even in the midst of confusion and difficulty. A candle of love, God's love for each and every one of us, with no exceptions. And today's candle of joy. There's always one. Let's say together this uh, prayer, this responsive prayer on the screens. I'll say the part that says lead and let's all join together for all. We want to magnify you, Lord, for you have done great things. And though change feels slow and is sometimes hard to find, we know that it comes. And so our spirit rejoices in you, God our Savior. For those who are oppressed or marginalized, we pray your loving presence to be as real to them as it was to Mary when she proclaimed, you have looked with favor on your lowly servant. Give us open hearts and unblocked ears to hear the voices of the poor and oppressed 
and to act to share their struggle for justice. For those who have experienced violence or been forced to flee their homes, we pray for your mercy, which is for those who fear you from generation to generation. For those who experience racial hatred or who suffer the oppression of tyrants and dictators, we pray that they may co take comfort in knowing justice is coming. For you have brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. For the poor and hungry, we pray they may experience what it means to be filled with good things while the rich are sent away empty. Remembering your mercy, we pray you will fill us with the joy of the Magnificat and empower us to share your love with all. Amen. We're going to take uh, communion now as an act of worship. Um, in many ways, these are very lowly symbols, just a, a piece of, of dry cracker and a small cup of juice. But these symbols remind us of the power of God's love and the willingness of God to lift up the lowly, to fill the hungry with good things, to show love and mercy from one generation to another. So let's come with joy together and take communion. Everybody is welcome. <laughs> 